So good morning. Uh, thank you for attending, first of all, and thank you to Nordix for letting me speak. Just before I continue, just to clarify what we mean by consumer, for the purpose of this presentation, a consumer is somebody consuming from a public API. So I know that's not always the case, but for the purpose of this, it is. OK, so a little bit about me, just super quick. Um, the Cloud Native Development Lead for Capgemini in the Cloud Solutions Business Unit. Um, I've had experience of front-end development, doing UIs and back-end development. But again, for this presentation, I'm focusing purely with my front-end developer hat on. And uh, Twitter and GitHub handles, so feel free to reach out. OK, so consuming APIs. Now, that's quite a, quite a broad term, and it's only a 20-minute presentation. So what I've done is I've chosen the top three factors or top three characteristics of an API that people are interested in. So we can see here the usability, the performance, and the documentation. So this was taken from the 2019 State of API report by SmartBear. So there's a link on the bottom if you want to see it. Um, but interestingly, one of the things to point out is last time they did the report in 2016, documentation, which is now the third most important, was actually seventh. So what we're seeing is as more people are using APIs and as more APIs are being created, documentation is becoming more important. So I think the statistics were over 60% for the usability, so how easy is it to use the API? And then it was just over 50% of all the respondents said that the performance and documentation were key. So usability, like I said, how easy is it for a consumer to use and also understand the API? So now if we take a look at REST, so this is a real world example. Um, it might actually shock you. So this example we've got on the screen, we see in the post at the endpoint forward slash products, and we can see the category, color, size, class, and owner. Now, if I was to ask you, what's that doing? The chances are everybody or most people would say it's creating a new product. That's not the case. What's actually happening is this is a search. Now, this is the equivalent of a get request, and it's saying I would like all of the products where the criteria is category is table, color is white, etc. So the reason why the developer chose to make this into a post instead of a get was because of the owner field. Now, the owner field, because it contains an email address, falls under the big GDPR umbrella. So if we replace that as a query parameter in the URI, then because the URI is logged in many different layers of the stack, it, it, it creates a problem for us down the line. So they chose to create a post. But equally, from a consumer's perspective, when you look at that, it doesn't make sense because you inherently assume HTTP post is the equivalent of a create. So after some analysis, the developers figured out that nobody was actually using the owner field. So then they changed it to a get request. They put a great big version in front of it and then took all of those attributes and now created them in query parameters. So if we look at the exact same scenario, but from a GraphQL perspective, we can see that in GraphQL, the first word there is query. So in, there's two main types. So we have query and a mutation. The third one is subscription that Lewis mentioned before. But here, we're explicitly saying that we're doing a query. So it makes no difference whatsoever as to regards of the HTTP method, because to GraphQL, it's usually a post to the endpoint slash GraphQL. So we're doing um, a query on the products, and we're saying the same attributes that we can see in the REST API. Um, but, but equally on GraphQL, we're saying now we're looking at the ID, the name, and the price field. So again, the same scenario. We remove the owner field. Um, so in GraphQL, their approach to versioning is, is quite open and straightforward. There isn't, there isn't any versioning. Um, instead, your mark field is deprecated. So we can see here that the owner field was deprecated, and then we can remove it from the query. So between the two things, not much has changed. But in comparison to REST, it looks very, very different. So to summarize usability, I'd say from a REST perspective, a consumer is heavily dependent on the HTTP methods and also the URI names. Now, I've put this as a sideways thumbs up because depending on how the API is designed depends on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. So if it's bad in the example with a post, then it's going to be a negative aspect. But if it's done well, it's positive. And then the second approach is the API versioning. So for REST with API versioning, it's, it's a painful topic, I'll be honest. Um, but everybody has their own way of doing it. There isn't really a clear defined approach. Now, Roy Fielding said, we don't version APIs. But I'm sure we all know, in reality, APIs get versioned. And then for GraphQL, 
because you're explicitly defining in the payload what you're doing, so you're saying, I'm doing a query, or I'm doing a mutation, it's extremely clear to a consumer what's happening with the API. And again, they've got a clear versioning approach, which is to say, we don't version. So moving on to performance. So this is a really simple use case. Um, so we have a UI, and in the UI it's got a world map, and you can select multiple countries, and then you can hit a button, it sends REST calls, or you can hit another, but another button, and it sends GraphQL calls. So if we look on the, on the REST side for a second, we can see there's three calls leaving the browser. So we've chosen three countries. We chose France, Spain, and Belgium. And we can see one call per, um, per country. So if we chose four countries, then we'd see four calls coming out. Now, on the other side, from a GraphQL perspective, there's only one call leaving the browser. And the call leaving the browser is saying, I would like the information for France, Spain, and Belgium. Once it's received in the GraphQL server, it does whatever it needs to do behind the scenes and aggregates that data and sends it back across to the browser. So this, this screen is often one of the things that people say where GraphQL is, is better than REST or it beats REST, the fact that I only need one request to leave the browser in order to fulfill one action within my UI, whereas in REST, I need more than one in this case. I needed three. However, I would argue OK, that, that's great, and it's true. But equally, if the REST API was in production and it was designed well, chances are there would be some content delivery network or a web cache or reverse proxy or something sat in front of that API. So yes, we still have the three calls leaving the browser going to the target system. But if those calls happening constantly and they were cacheable, then the response time from those calls from the cache back to the browser would be quicker than the one response coming from the GraphQL service, because the GraphQL is going to have to go back to the source. Now, I'm not saying there isn't any caching options for GraphQL, because there is. You can cache on um, the server side, and equally, you can cache on the client side. But the URI itself doesn't lead to caching, because the URI is always slash GraphQL. In comparison to on REST, where we can see the URI is specific for the resource we're trying to reach. So again, to summarize, from a REST perspective, it's really simple to cache the URI. It was sort of designed to do that. But often, you need multiple requests to fulfill one action within the UI. And then for GraphQL, the URI itself can't be cached. But the benefit is you only need one request, because it can aggregate all of your data. So moving on to documentation. So documentation, so how accurate and detailed is the API documentation? Now, from a REST perspective, there's many different ways of doing it. The open API specification, API blueprint, they're just two out of a, a huge list. But equally, those two specifications have different ways of displaying the data. So what we can see on the left-hand side of the screen is a screenshot from a tool called Apiary. Now, within Apiary, it was built on this particular one as an API blueprint definition. And we can see that there's a brief description uh, around here of the endpoint that we've got. And then underneath, we have, when you click it, you can see the full URI along with the example parameters that you need. Now, further down on that page, you would see a request body and also example payloads and responses, that sort of thing. So this is very much a manual process. However, there are tools out there that generate this documentation for you from a REST perspective. Now, for GraphQL, the main or the most common thing that I've encountered in terms of GraphQL documentation is what we call graphical. Um, as we can see, a screenshot of Graphical on the top left one there. And within Graphical, it's sort of like a live IDE where you can build your queries to get relevant results. And then once you've built your query, you can take that and place it into your application. But as part of the Graphical interface, there's a section called Docs, which is the screenshot on the top right corner. And within that Docs, these are all automatically generated from the, uh, from the code. So that's great. And people say, you know, for GraphQL, that's probably one of the uh, one of the main benefits of GraphQL, or one of the biggest selling points, is the fact that you don't have to do any work. All of the documentation is generated for you. But I'd say that for both REST and GraphQL, the auto-generated documentation it's not enough, not for a public API, because the auto-generated documentation gives you the information about the objects, but it doesn't handle things like the authentication or any financial implications, rate limits, or any plans, that sort of thing. So there's always more documentation needed and required in order to fulfill the concept of a public API. So there's a link there at the bottom in the GraphQL section, and that's a list of all of the public GraphQL APIs that exist. And if you click on that, 
you'll see that the majority of them, if not all of them, um, all contain the graphical or links to graphical. Obviously, you've got your own custom themes and skins, but it's the same underneath the hood. And then to the right-hand side of that, there's a column called additional documentation. And almost all of the APIs have additional documentation. So that just proves the point that the auto-generated documentation is great, but it's not enough. And that's for both, not just uh, GraphQL. So to summarize the documentation, I'd say that purely for documentation, for REST, there's rich tools out there. There's many, many different ways of doing it. But equally, that leads to what I would call a varied experience for a consumer in the concept of I've been given, well, I've been given API documents, Swagger Hub, somebody's even given me a PDF on how to use an API. So every different API has their own, their own flavor, their own way of, of documenting the information. Now, in contrast for GraphQL, it's pretty much reverse round. So limited tooling, so by that, I don't mean limited tooling for GraphQL. I'm talking purely in terms of the documentation. The main thing that I've seen in my experience for GraphQL is graphical. But equally, because it's, it's limited or not as mature as the rest, it's ensuring a consistent experience for the consumer in the sense that if I've consumed from a GraphQL API, take the GitHub one, for example, and I've spent some time in graphical and I've figured out the shortcuts, the, the tips, the way it's laid out, etc. If you give me another GraphQL API and expose graphical, I'm going to know exactly what I need to do because I've done it before. Whereas it's not, it's not the same thing for REST because the slight differences between, say, API and Swagger Hub. So as you might have, might have spotted, uh, technically GraphQL wins on this. Um, it's got more thumbs up than REST does. But equally, because this was only a 20 minute presentation, I could only pick the top three factors. I think personally that if um, all of the factors were taken into account, then I still believe REST would be ahead. Uh, that's not a, it's not a dig at GraphQL, it's just not as mature as REST. But ultimately, even with that in mind, I would say that a well-designed API is always going to outshine a poorly designed API, regardless of whatever technology it's been built in. So following on from that, I'm going to do a quick demonstration based on the use case I mentioned in the performance slides. So apologies at the back if, if you can't see. I can zoom in, but I'm not going to be able to zoom into the, uh, the developer tools. So here I'm going to select France, Norway, and Sweden. And if I open the developer tools, we can see there's nothing hidden from you. And I click the REST button. We can see that we now have, on the right-hand side of the screen, we've got three calls being made. We've got one for France, one for Norway, and one for Sweden. One of the side points, I wasn't going to talk about this, but it happened in this case, is I selected France first, Norway second, and Sweden third, which is denoted by this bottom list here. But if we look at the responses on the right-hand side, where it says type rest calls made three, we can see that the way it came back was France first, Sweden second, and Norway third. And that was just a side effect of making three separate calls from the browser. So to make these um, visualizations, I needed the short, the short code of the country, so in this case, NOR for Norway, the full name, and then the population. But if we look at what's come back from the API, we can see we get all of this information. Now, I don't need all of that information in order to make this, this UI work. And that's probably one of the biggest or strongest points of GraphQL is people say, you only get what you ask for. So if I do the same thing for GraphQL, the first thing we see is only one request was made. And if we look at the data that came back, we now see that we got the data we asked for. So we got the data for Sweden, Norway, and France. And for each one of those, we only got the code, the name, and the population. So with that in mind, you might be thinking, OK, well, it makes sense to use GraphQL, right? However, the API that we're using here is the REST Countries API. So if I go on the REST Countries website, and this is, their, this is their API documentation. So again, this is different to APRE and Swagger Hub. And there's something caught my eye on the left called filter response. So if I click on filter response, we can see that it says, you can filter the output of your request to include only the specified fields. So in the case of this demo, I only wanted the name, the code, and the population. So if I do this, we can now see that the same three calls were made However, in the data that came back, we only got the code, the name, and the population. 
So on the face of things, if we just look at the first two, so the first three, three REST calls we made on the GraphQL core, you'd argue, OK, well, it makes sense to use GraphQL. Whereas now, sort of the seeds of doubt are beginning to set in the sense of, OK, well, we're getting this behavior from a REST API. So the difference, you might say, is, yeah, but we still need, we still need three calls. So then the final point I'm going to make is the caching of the URI that we mentioned before. So if your UI is something that is calling a resource regularly, I'm just going to enable the browser cache. So now this is a really extreme example because it's coming from disk as opposed to over the network. But if I do the same call to the REST API, we can now see that it came back in milliseconds. And if we do it for GraphQL, we can see that it took 336 milliseconds, which is similar to what it did the first time. And the reason for that is because in this example, the GraphQL URI cannot be cached. Therefore, it has to go back to the source to get the information every single time. So I'd say, to summarize, um, you could argue that the consumer of your API is somewhat at the mercy of an API designer. So things like um, the API first design methodology are great because it allows the it allows the consumer to be part of that process really early on. Now, REST and GraphQL both have their own pros and cons. Um, but what I've tried to show in this presentation is it's the way I feel it is that the design of the API has a bigger or equal impact in whether an API is going to be consumed consumed, sorry, compared to the technology it's built in. So the question shouldn't be, is this API REST or is it a GraphQL? The question should be, OK, is it REST or GraphQL? But also, how well designed is this API? And uh, that's a wrap from me. So thank you. <laughs>